Hello, my name is DG Blair and I'm pleased to uh, welcome you to a webinar called Introduction to Green Shores in Atlantic Canada. Uh, my name is DG Blair and I'm happy to share a little bit of information about uh, Green Shores and how it can be applied in Atlantic Canada. And thanks to the Mercy Tobayek Research Institute for hosting this webinar today. So for those who are not familiar, uh, the Stewardship Center is a nonprofit organization uh, in British Columbia, and our mandate is to strengthen ecological stewardship by providing educational, technical, and capacity programs and resources to organizations, governments, the private sector, and the general public. And we always do this through collaborative partnerships. Uh, you can go to the Stewardship Center bc.ca and find out all about our various programs and resources that are offered. So today I will cover um, basically an introduction to the Green Shores program, including rationale, components, some successes and impacts, and also talk a bit about uh, some of the work that's underway to bring uh, Green Shores to Atlantic Canada through some next steps. And hopefully we'll have some time to have some questions and answers at the end. So to get started, I thought I would just share this photograph of uh, a project that uh, was a home uh, in um, Washington State. And it uh, was part of uh, the initiative to establish uh, Green Shores for Homes. And this is what the property looked like before Green Shores. And then this is the property that it looked like after the restoration and achieved a Green Shores rating. So just that before and after is always a great way to inspire people to see the significant changes that can happen through using the Green Shores design guidance. So what is Green Shores? Basically, it's a rigorous standard that has been made up of these four guiding principles. The first is we want to preserve or restore shoreline physical processes. We want to maintain or enhance habitat function and diversity. We want to prevent or reduce pollutants from entering the aquatic environment. And um, in doing so, what we're doing is we're not only looking at what happens on that interface between the uh, water and the shore, but also what happens upland. And then finally, we want to avoid or reduce cumulative impacts to the shore. Why did green shores come about? And uh, we like to use this uh, insects to orcas. And, and really it's all about um, recognizing that functioning lake and marine shorelines are really vital to our most iconic species. Uh, and there's a relationship to what happens upland on a shore, what happens at that interface between the shore and the water, and then uh, moving on up the food chain uh, to those iconic species, which for example, in British Columbia, are the, uh, the orca whales. So without that uh, shoreline vegetation and rack, the forage fish that are um, on the, the immediate uh, foreshore, then we won't have those species up the food chain and ultimately we won't have those iconic species. So what we do on the shore and just upland really makes a difference to aquatic species. However, we do have some challenges. We have uh, things where we put fill in and uh, along the shore, and then that is eroding. We've um, we've have uh, increased storm intensity, like we see in the upper left, and uh, we have challenges that way. We do things like put um, groins into the uh, into the water, and then have uh, sediment acu accumulate. Uh, up upstream and uh, the, the beach actually getting starved downstream of that uh, of that groin like we see in the lower left and then finally and probably uh, the most significant part of what's been happening in terms of shoreline alteration in British Columbia is we've put in a lot of seawalls and 
I think what we need to recognize is that at the time when many of these seawalls were put in, they were the best practice at the time, thought to be the best practice. But we've come to realize the impact of those uh, seawalls um, are fairly significant. Uh, and you can see here this uh, seawall in the lower right that shows um, a wave hitting a seawall and uh, that actually is in West Vancouver, British Columbia and that uh, wave actually went farther up and, and broke some uh, glass along some balconies just upslope of this, of this, uh, this seawall. So what is Greenshores uh, help with? Basically, it provides a, a framework for being able to protect property as well as helping the environment. So with the hard armoring approach, and it really, uh, Greenshores really encourages the nature-based soft approaches in addition to um, other best practices like low impact development, for example, use of native vegetation. So when we compare the hard armor approach versus the, the green shores type approach, uh, basically in the hard armor approach, we, uh, we don't restore physical, those shoreline processes. We don't enhance habitat. We uh, don't uh, reduce pollutants and we actually increase the cumulative impact. Um, we can get scouring erosion at the base of uh, uh, seawalls. And generally, if we use a nature-based approach that's designed appropriately for the uh, location, then we can increase ecological health. We can maintain our uh, property uh, in terms of protecting it from uh, erosion. And then it really does encourage better, better beach access. And, um, Basically, we're, we're looking at a, a, a project that will uh, help protect properties as well as help the environment. So one of the questions that came up uh, as we've been um, moving forward is looking at um, what are the approaches that Greenshores can uh, help with? And from a local government uh, perspective, the motivator is that Greenshores does fit really well in with climate adaptation planning and shoreline asset management. Um, from the property owner or developer's perspective, um, overall they tend to be uh, looking at uh, wanting to protect the ecosystem health as well as reduce their risk of property damage. And from the uh, professional's perspective, really getting into this sort of uh, work is, it can be profitable and a lot of uh, shoreline professionals really do um, like utilizing a Greenshores nature-based approach and Greenshores can help frame, um, can frame uh, how they can do projects better. So how is Greenshores delivered in British Columbia? Well, it's been an iterative and uh, organic uh, process in terms of moving from a one credit, one credit and rating system, which is Greenshores for Shoreline Development for larger scale projects. Then we added Greenshores for Homes, um, which is obviously for residential properties, single family homes. And those two credit and rating systems form the backbone of Greenshores, what Greenshores is all about. And I'll speak more to those uh, credit and rating systems uh, in a few in a few moments. The other thing that we've got is uh, green shores for local governments. So we have a local government working group, and supporting that we have uh, training uh, for shoreline professionals for the general public. We have uh, certification uh, so that projects that utilize the credit and rating systems can uh, achieve a green shores rating. And then finally, uh, we have a soon to be launched a registration for uh, Greenshores accredited professionals. And I'll speak uh, about uh, all these aspects in the coming slides. So let's start with Greenshores for shoreline development. So as, uh, as the slide shows, uh, basically Greenshores for shoreline development is commercial, multifamily, residential, subdivisions, parks, and institutional waterfront properties. It is based on the four guiding principles that I mentioned, and uh, it is for both marine and lake shorelines. The idea here is that it offers solutions that are um, shore friendly in nature. 
So let's take a little bit more about the specifics. Uh, oh, and they are also based on the four uh, green chores guiding principles that are translated into a series of credits. So let's take a look at these various credits. Um, basically, in Green Shores uh, for Shoreline Development, it's a voluntary credits uh, and rating system that is designed to promote sustainable shoreline development. Um, because they're for larger scale projects, many of these prerequisites and credits required qualified coastal professional sign off. In general, it promotes greater setbacks, soft shore nature based approaches, and really robust, robust riparian vegetative buffers. You can see here, and I apologize for the size of the slides, uh, of the, of the uh, font size there, but basically we have four, sorry, five prerequisites uh, for, that all projects have to meet. And then on top of that, there's 10 credits that uh, projects can, can gain uh, a series of points for. Um, so let's take a look more specifically on an example. Um, so this is uh, an example of credit one, uh, site design with the conservation of shore zones. So the idea here is that we want to promote um, development to be farther back from the shore. And so you get a credit uh, where you basically make um, public area uh, in front of any, any development. So, here you can see that what we want to do is permanently designate a minimum of 75% of the shore length as common area, subject to no development, um, and that um, the average width is either the projected erosion uh, over the project lifeline or 30 meters, whichever is greater, and that we want a minimum width of 7.5 meters at any given point. So here you can see that it's quite specific. We need that minimum of 75% of that shoreline length, and then we need um, the 30 meters uh, or the erosion, and then a minimum width of 7.5. So we can have fairly specific uh, criteria and that it is uh, very much measurable. And that's one of the things that makes Green Shores a little different than general guidance general guidelines is that it's verifiable. And then depending on, on what, uh, depending on what your um, design option is, you get more points. So you can see here that an urban park will get, um, will get one point, whereas uh, if we have a conservation area, you can get as many as three points. So that's Green Shores for coastal development, uh, for shoreline development. And um, the second credit and rating system we have is Green Shores for homes. And uh, as it sounds, it's for residential properties. Uh, it's for both freshwater, lake, and marine shorelines. And the idea with, um, with residential properties is that we really want to encourage incremental improvements. So it's not an all or nothing thing. So if a property owner, can improve by 50%, you get credit by that 50% improvement. If you get, um, if you do 75 or 90% uh, improvement, then you're gonna get more points for that. So it incentivizes um, more of these best practices. So again, it's based on the four uh, Green Shores guiding principles. So the way uh, Green Shores for Homes is uh, broken out, it's a little different than uh, green Shores for Shoreline Development, but basically you have credits, you have a series of credits in four different categories. Shoreline process credits, shoreline habitat credits, water quality credits, and shore stewardship credits. And for those of you who were paying attention with the Green Shores principles, you can see that there's really a nice alignment between these categories and the principles, um, so uh, the Green Shores principles. So let's look at an example of Green Shores for Homes uh, credit. Again, you can see the specificity of it, that you can get more credits for, uh, more points, pardon me, for having a more robust um, approach. So you can get uh, credit in terms of setback of uh, avoidance. So if you set back to the 75 year setback plus sea level rise, you're gonna get 10 points uh, for this credit. 
Uh, plus, there are also bonus points. So again, it's verifiable in a way to move forward. And basically, the two credit and rating systems, the way it works is that you can have, um, you encourage by use of these credits, more best practices going into each and every, every project. Another aspect of um, the program is what we call our Green Shores for Local Government. It's a working group that was established because we realized just having the two credit and rating systems was not enough. We needed to provide support to the local, at the local community level to enable these credit and rating systems to be used um, on shoreline various projects. So we established the, the local government group. Basically, through the local government group, what we do is we focus our education uh, delivery for the workshops um, to, at the community level. So uh, a member community has um, an introduction to Green Shores a workshop delivered in their community. We host um, monthly peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learning opportunities through teleconferences and Zoom meetings. We offer support for Green Shores demonstration projects, um, mostly through uh, working together to um, access uh, additional resources and partners and funding opportunities. And basically by having a working group, we, we are um, demonstrating local support to provincial and federal uh, governments for this type of approach. Um, we have a stronger voice by working together than working individually. The other thing that we've added uh, about the same time as the local government working group is um, delivery of training. We found that having, um, uh, having training opportunities really has increased the up uptake of um, utilizing the two credit and rating systems. So we've established these in collaboration with post-secondary institutions. So uh, in British Columbia, um, University of Victoria and British Columbia Institute of Technology are our um, partners in delivering Green Shores trainings. And currently we are um, working with St. Mary's University and U University of PEI to develop memorandums of understandings, letters of agreement to uh, deliver training locally. So the training is basically a combination of uh, working uh, with uh, the group to do uh, in-class exercises as well as uh, doing field-based training. And uh, I will have to say that uh, getting out into the field is the thing that really pulls it together for, for most participants. And I can't say enough about the fact that the increasing the training really increased, there's a direct correlation between the number of projects that started to come on board as folks uh, had taken, uh, especially the Green Shores level two training. So we do have a target date uh, for September 2020 to deliver um, Green Shores level one and level two in both Nova Scotia and PEI, depending on uh, the ministers of health and uh, the situation with COVID. So hopefully we'll be able to do that uh, in come the fall. The other aspect of Green Shores is uh, the process that we've established in British Columbia to have projects enroll and uh, receive uh, Green Shores certification. Basically, um, having a project go through the whole process really offers uh, compelling proof that a project has met uh, the environmental goals. And I'll share this um, quote from the uh, from the city of Vancouver and uh, about um, having been honored to uh, as, uh, achieve this environmental stewardship recognition. And I think this is the sort of thing, especially for the larger scale projects, that it is a way to verify that a project really has met uh, the goals uh, from an environmental perspective, as well as showing uh, leadership in uh, meeting those goals. So how does the certification process work? Basically, uh, there's three basic stages. Stage one, enroll and initiate. And, uh, there I am uh, receiving uh, an enrollment and obviously looking pretty happy about that. 
Um, the second stage is, uh, I think, is probably the, it's the largest and it is the most critical. Uh, basically, you utilize the two credit and one or the other, the credit and rating systems uh, guides to help uh, guide the uh, dis project design as well as collect information as you go, um, all the documentation, photographs, et cetera, that are necessary to uh, fill out the, in, uh, the template that comes with the uh, enrollment. And then once you've uh, collected all your documentation, you submit that documentation um, at, of the completed project to the Stewardship Center. We assign a verifier, and then if you, the project has met the, uh, all the various credits, um, then you receive the award. And this is a photograph on the far right of the first Green Shores for Homes uh, certified project in British Columbia. And uh, along with the uh, myself and the uh, project contractor, a happy day. So let's uh, give an example here. This is Green Shores for Shoreline Development, uh, New Brighton Park project in the city of Vancouver. Uh, basically, they did a habitat restoration, uh, restoring um, the uh, access to a. Uh, they daylighted a stream and then recreated the. Um, the uh, estuarine uh, environment uh, and uh, took out uh, some uh, hard armoring there. And you can see on the uh, right, um, those funny looking things that look like uh, pens or something, uh, our nets are actually netting over the newly planted vegetation because the, they found that the uh, Canada geese were uh, chomping on all those fresh, uh, fresh uh, sprouting, uh, vegetation that they had just planted so they took that up but you can see a substantive change between the two very successful project and uh, here's an example of green shores for homes this is a uh, obviously much smaller scale it's utilizing the green shores for homes credit and ratings guide and you can see the erosion that's happening on that shore and then uh, you can see the, um, the finished product on the right and they obviously match the uh, type of the beach with uh, the um, native uh, substrate there. So um, those plants will uh, eventually grow to be a little bit uh, more fulsome. So um, another aspect of the, the program as it's been developed in British Columbia was the need for a registry of uh, accredited professionals. Basically, what happens is people, when they want to have, uh, do a Green Shores project, they, they get in touch with us and say, you know, I, I'd like to have, do a Green Shores project, who do I call? And at this point, we have people who've taken the training, but there's no registry per se. So we decided to uh, develop a course, which we're calling uh, Level 3. And uh, completion of that level three course will lead to this um, accredited professional listing on the Green Shores web pages. And that way it will facilitate uh, project proponents being able to know who to call depending on their the situation that they need. And it also aids um, accredited professionals getting in touch with uh, potential uh, project proponents. So it's sort of a win-win uh, situation. And uh, so that uh, we're aiming to have that out and uh, up and running in uh, sometime in the fall of 2020. So um, one of the things that has come up is how does uh, Green Shores all work together? And it is something uh, where we look at saying, okay, how if we are going to be moving Green Shores from just a BC based uh, program and initiative into areas, let's say, like the Maritimes, what are the different elements that need to work together? And so the Stewardship Center for British Columbia functions as the Green Shores backbone or coordinating organization. We worked by organizing the Green Shores um, local government working group. We coordinate Green Shores technical committees to ensure that the design guidance is um, is up to date and has the ability to answer um, 
answer any questions that come along and um, adapt to uh, changing uh, the latest science and best practices. We establish relationships with uh, post-secondary institutions to co-deliver training because, because uh, the Greenshore's design guidance is uh, very much linked to the Stewardship Center. Um, delivery of training is very much a thing where uh, the Stewardship Center is involved in uh, delivering the training. We have uh, the registry, or soon to be up on the website, uh, Registry of Accredited Professionals. That is something we're committed to doing. And then we have a process where, um, and a Green Shores Projects Coordinator, uh, where a project can be enrolled and use the design guidance, and uh, we uh, send verifiers out and we issue the certificates. And then finally, we do do uh, research and development to make sure that um, we work with our technical committees to have um, Green Shores keep up with the times. So that's how Green Shores is functions in British Columbia. One of the things we're very curious about is if Green Shores or when Green Shores gets expanded beyond British Columbia, how can we do that in a, um, a consistent and uh, useful way? Uh, so we hired uh, ESSA consultants to take a look at um, what we're doing here in British Columbia and how can that be utilized for uh, rolling it out to, to other places. And so one of the things that they did was did this results change, taking a look at the inputs and assets that support Green Shores, the activities and services that we um, provide in British Columbia, what are the outcomes from those activities and services, and ultimately what are the impacts of what we do. So I just wanted to highlight um, a little bit about uh, outcomes, that uh, this is one of the things that, found, uh, that they found out through a series of interviews and a survey in BC, um, that basically really we have through the program increased skills, knowledge, awareness, attitudes, and access to green shores um, by basically um, increasing the skills of shoreline professionals, uh, increase education and awareness of municipal staff and local government decision makers. Um, we've increased confidence among municipal staff to engage with property owners on, on green shores. And um, so those are a number of skills uh, th th that have improved based on the programs. And then basically looking at um, behaviors and practices and, and access to these resources really We've increased um, highlights include, you know, incorporation of Green Shores principles in university curricula. We've increased um, incorporation of Green Shores principles in OCPs and park designs. And that has been really um, fairly significant so that that, that has been um, a direct outcome of the work we've been doing in British Columbia uh, here with the Stewardship Center. But then when we look at um, the actual impacts, um, the long-term impacts, but basically from a property uh, owner or manager perspectives, we really increased the ability of them to utilize the knowledge and resources and clear understanding of what are the best science-based best practices. Um, we've increased uh, through Green Shores for them to have uh, protection from erosion, flooding, and sea level rise. And I really like this last one in terms of understanding that uh, property owners can um, show leadership or managers can show leadership. And from a professional's perspective, um, businesses can have a market differentiation. And then really from a coastal environment perspective, um, Utilizing the, if you go back to those four guiding principles, they really have shown out in terms of the function. Um, one of the things that uh, we were more curious about in terms of the shoreline environments, what is it, is it possible to really get uh, a more thorough understanding of, of uh, the outcomes from a value perspective? So. Um, ESSA also ran uh, what we call a triple bottom line evaluation. 
And um, in that, what, what we have is taking a look at habitat services, cultural services, and environmental regulatory services. And that New Brighton Park project, we ran through um, a tool that would generate um, the value. So um, from New Brighton Park, basically the net annualized benefit of doing that restoration is on the almost, um, well, $0.7 million per, per year. And the benefit to cost ratio um, for that project is 2.5. So they got 2.5 times more value than what they put in uh, by doing the restoration when you look at it from a triple bottom line evaluation perspective. So that's significant. And we now have this tool and we will be able to use it on, on different projects as we, as we move forward. So taking a look at what are the next steps uh, for the Maritimes, I always like to take a look, is that, is it gonna be smooth uh, stones and uh, a very linear path forward? Or is it gonna be something a little bit more confusing like a, a dance step? And, and I expect it's gonna be somewhere between the two, but um, know that the Stewardship Center is committed to sharing uh, green shores uh, right across the country because we recognize that um, when it was started back in uh, 2010, that it, that it really was bigger than just British Columbia and, and could have application right across the country or indeed uh, internationally. So uh, whatever steps that we have to take, uh, provided we have uh, capacity, we are very much into supporting uh, the next steps as they move ahead. So um, the, the first thing really is that backbone, remember the credit and ratings uh, system. So we have uh, just completed an update to Green Shores for Shoreline Development, thanks to funding from Natural Resources Canada. So the pilot edition of that uh, credit and ratings guide is uh, now uh, launched and um, will be uh, utilized, uh, right across, can be utilized on both, uh, both coasts. Uh, the next uh, step is to uh, develop uh, or do an update to Green Shores for Homes credit and rating guide. Um, we have done uh, some work uh, in terms of planning for that update. And uh, once we have capacity to move forward, um, we would be targeting hopefully uh, a launch of 2023 and uh, have a, um, have that um, move forward there. We're, right now, we're currently establishing uh, partnerships and relationships to, to complete that. Having said that, the credit and rating system um, for Green Shores for Homes, there's much of it that is applicable uh, to uh, the Maritimes as it currently is written, uh, but obviously we would like to have it, uh, have the update done similar to what we've done to Green Shores for Shoreline Development. So um, as part of that, um, we've uh, been working with the Mercy uh, MTRI to, um, and, and other partners to really take a look at how we could roll out Green Shores for Homes. And so um, as of uh, March 31st, we developed a quality assurance project plan uh, basically, uh, the plan objectives are one, to develop uh, this guidance uh, for Green Shores for Homes so that uh, it can be used on both the Pacific and Atlantic coasts. We would want to have support so that we can develop and deliver appropriate uh, Green Shores training uh, to professionals and property owners and managers in Nova Scotia and support land use decision makers and local governments through knowledge mobilizations uh, through a, and through a, a Nova Scotia local government working group. And this is what we would like to do in terms of moving forward. And we've uh, established a plan um, that uh, will detail, that details uh, what it is uh, we, need to, we need to do for next steps. We also have some supporting uh, documentation through um, our work with that triple bottom line evaluation um, and the project report uh, to have a roadmap for uh, bringing green shores to Atlantic Canada. And if you recall, ESSA took a look at what, what we were doing in British Columbia and then 
um, have uh, done some, did some work in terms of surveys. Um, we held some meetings. So basically, what is it? What does the roadmap look like? And um, the first is basically to um, ground truth the theory of change for bringing green shores to Atlantic Canada. We know that in Atlantic Canada, the situation is different than in British Columbia. And what, are, what is the theory of change? What is it that we need to um, look at um, from, from that perspective? So we need to dedicate some, um, some resources and capacity to, to do that. We need to identify and develop uh, the capacity of a backbone organization. So um, just know that the Stewardship Center will not just, um, you know, toss it out there and, and, and say, okay, you're on your own. It is something where there'll be an ongoing relationship, but nevertheless, we recognize we're not going to be delivering green chores in the Maritimes. We need or an organization or organizations that will uh, be the on the boots on the ground uh, work in in uh, in the Maritimes. So that we need to um, develop that. So effort needs to be put into in uh, step number two. And then I think uh, the step number three is the the big one is we need to put in place enablers uh, for green shores deployment and adoption. So increase education and awareness. Uh, increase demonstration projects, provide training, local uh, training for professionals, and address any regulatory barriers. And that's number three is huge. Those enablers we need to we need to move out, move forward. And we're still working on those here in British Columbia for sure. So um, it'll it'll be a, a win-win, let's learn together type of approach. So how can you get involved with Green Shores? Um, Step number one really is to take the Green Shores training. You can take Green Shores training online at um, British Columbia Institute of Technology or hopefully uh, in the fall and at St. Mary's or UPEI. And if it doesn't happen in the fall, it, it'll, it, it will happen. Um, certainly get in touch if your organ, organization is learning more or uh, is interested in learning more or participating in the next steps. Um, we've got a lot of great um, uh, resources on our website uh, to learn more. There you can see Stewardship Center forward slash Green Shores. Uh, it does offer registration links to training and um, past webinars, which is really interesting. And it has links for download, uh, downloadable PDFs of the credit and ratings guides and uh, other resources. We do have some upcoming webinars. Uh, so the first is June the 9th uh, from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern, helping Canadians to do the right things, uh, Green Shores for Shoreline Development. Um, and that will be uh, giving an overview of the update for the Green Shores for Shoreline Development Credit Ratings Guide by myself and um, the lead from uh, Coastal Geologic Services. And then following that, we're going to be doing another webinar, which is focused for Green Shores um, Shoreline Practitioners, which will dive mu into much more detail uh, about the specifics of uh, the credit uh, updates. If you're not familiar with the uh, Green Shores for Shoreline Development Credit and Ratings Guide or haven't used it before, which you probably haven't, then really um, the June 9th one is more of an introduction and the June 24th one is meant for people who are familiar with the uh, guide that was updated. And um, so you can uh, take a look at one or both of those. Uh, registration is, uh, there's links to registration for both of them on our website. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for this um, opportunity to share some time with you today. Uh, we do have some time for some questions. And uh, here's my uh, email uh, address. And I'd like to also thank uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada uh, MTRI, as well as the government of Nova Scotia for uh, helping uh, support this uh, project and uh, pulling together this webinar. So now I'll turn it over to some, uh, some questions that have come in. Uh, 
And the first one is where and when will we be able to see the guidelines for the Maritimes? So basically the um, guide, guidance for uh, that's applicable to the Maritimes is already up uh, for the Green Shores for Shoreline Development. You can download the PDF uh, from our website. And uh, we, as I mentioned, the Green Shores for Homes, it's, you are able to download the Green Shores for Homes guide from our website, but we will be looking at doing a specific update for the Maritimes uh, as we have a funding capacity to do that update. Um, our target is 2023 to have the complete credit and rating system updated at that time. The next question, is the aim for Green Shores to be a best practices guide for Fisheries Act authorizations? So basically, uh, Green Shores is a voluntary system. It was developed uh, as uh, to be voluntary. However, uh, basically, the, it is in keeping with um, various uh, legis legislative uh, approaches. So, for example, um, with the Fisheries Act, uh, you, if, if you follow those green shores, you will be in compliance or the project will be in compliance with um, any Fisheries Act uh, requirements. So you can utilize it, but it is not a, um, it's not a, a requirement per se. Um, it is meant to be voluntary in nature. The next question is, will the training at UPEI and St. Mary's be done in person or remotely? Well, that's, um, that's a great question. Um, the, the intention is to do them uh, both courses or um, training at both places as in, in person. Uh, I should mention that um, there is the, uh, the um, you can take a, uh, a virtual online approach to Green Shores, Introduction to Green Shores, that's available right now. You can, um, there's a link to it at, uh, on our website. It's the way the training works is continuous, uh, inter, uh, in, continuous enrollment. So basically when you enroll, you have three weeks to complete the course. Um, and so that can be done right now, but the, uh, the, the training that we're hoping to offer or will be offering eventually will be done in person as well. We find that the field-based courses, uh, particularly for level two, are, are, is the best option, um, but uh, we will maybe need to, to modify that um, because of the COVID situation. The next question is, what is the driver incentive for property owners to get involved with Green Shores? And, and that's the really big, it's a great question. Um, and uh, basically the incentives are that it, uh, you don't have an incentive per se, other than for the larger scale projects, they're demonstrating leadership and um, they get the kudos uh, and you can get media interest. But from a private property owner or green shores for homes, the incentives is generally in British Columbia is that because um, the green shores, the practices that green shores encourages are very much in keeping with um, what local governments in particular uh, are wanting to see in their projects that they can use it as design guidance to design their projects better. Um, what we would love to see is some sort of incentive similar to what they have in some jurisdictions in British Columbia for a, on a sewer charge. So for example, if you have, um, an, in areas where there's a, a fee for, for uh, sewer costs or the amount of water that goes into the sewer system, if you're using um, low impact, you get a credit if you use low impact development. Um, uh, and on a percentage of the uh, of your property, um, then you get a credit towards that reduces your sewerage fees. So if we could have some sort of incentive like that, um, I, I would love to see that. We're obviously still in the development stage of, of those sorts of incentives, and we're also looking at incentives um, 
through a, a Green Shores for Homes incentives project where we're offering things like shoreline assessments to uh, help encourage more projects uh, moving ahead. But generally speaking, uh, we have indirect incentives. So the indirect incentive is generally people want to do, if they're going to go and enroll a project, um, then if they're, they have a choice between achieving a bronze or a gold, people tend to want to achieve the gold so they'll incorporate more practices into their projects. So that's, that's an incentive. The other thing we have is generally because Green Shores approaches um, are in keeping with what local governments want, you have an easier time um, to get your project approved if you say, I'm following the Green Shores design guidance. It's not direct, but it is, it is an incentive. And if we can work on more direct incentives um, and offering those, then um, that that would be better, and it is certainly something that is is uh, is on the on the to do list. Um, can green shores be adapted to all coastal systems? Um, uh, for example, high, medium, and low energy. And the the, so the another excellent question. Um, yes, it it can be. Um, because green shores is not just about what happens if you go back to those guiding principles. It's not just about what happens um, at that interface between the, the water and the shoreline or just the foreshore and immediately, immediately above it. Uh, it is also about what happens upland on that, on that shore property. So there are aspects of green shores that can be applied to all different types of projects. Um, so I would argue that um, you can use um, it, plant native vegetation in pretty well uh, any, any coastal property. Um, however, I think probably the question is getting um, more at, um, are soft shore or nature-based solutions appropriate for um, all different types of shore, uh, shore systems? And that is something that has to be answered uh, by a, a qualified professional, a qualified coastal professional. And so one of the things uh, that we have is uh, in both uh, credit and rating systems is that if you are doing that sort of restoration, it has to be designed by a qualified uh, professional and also be signed, have signed off on that, um, that professional needs to sign off on that credit so that um, we know that the, the solution that is being uh, implemented is designed appropriately. And so um, not, as you know, not all uh, areas uh, can um, support a nature-based approach. Um, sometimes uh, basically what has to happen is buildings need to move back. Uh, and that is supported by Green Shores to, in, uh, you get credit for moving your structures uh, away from the shore. And, planting uh, what you've got in, in native vegetation. So it is appropriate, but uh, what you need to think about is what solutions are appropriate uh, for each individual project. And, and certainly Green Shores uh, encourages, um, encourages exploring that. And also if you are going to be uh, implementing a, um, a nature-based uh, approach to address erosion, then it has to be signed off by a qualified professional. Let's see, have you been working with Nova Scotia local governments to develop and deliver the program here? Uh, not yet. Uh, we very much hope that uh, we'll be able to uh, work with our, the, the Nova Scotia and um, hopefully other uh, uh, maritime provinces uh, organizations in these various in the maritime provinces uh, to establish that backbone or coordinating organization to uh, develop and deliver um, uh, a working group and uh, we certainly are uh, keen to, to move forward and, and mentor that and hopefully that will um, move ahead we've got some some possibilities, and uh, hopefully we can uh, enable that in the uh, 
in sometime uh, in the next year. For credits awarded for keeping areas uh, natural, uh, do, uh, for example, do you have to do a restoration project to get credit? And um, it's a, that's a really interesting question because a lot of times we think um, that we have to be doing uh, doing something to get credit for it. And one of the one of the uh, credits actually uh, on the riparian one is you actually get credit for doing nothing if you've got if you've got a really healthy riparian area. You don't you you need to maintain it or conserve it. So you you do get credit. So no, you don't have to do a restoration project. However, I will say that for the most part, um, I think the opportunity for green shores is when uh, project proponents um, have to do something or want to do something. And this is the opportunity for, the opportunity exists is when that project is gonna move ahead by utilizing the design guidance, you can have projects do a better job by getting more best practices in each and every project. So that I see is the real um, opportunity um, is when a project proponent um, is going to be doing something to their project, whether it be a large scale project or a small one. And um, then they can use the Green Shores uh, design guidance to, to design better projects. Uh, NBC, did implementing Green Shores require any provincial legislative changes? Uh, no. Uh, basically, Green Shores was developed along the line, um, similar to like LEED uh, for energy conservation or Built Green as a voluntary credit and rating system. So. Um, the design guidance is meant to be uh, voluntary and um, it uh, is often um, similar to LEED and Build Green that we think there's probably a number of, of projects out there that have utilized the design guidance but haven't necessarily uh, enrolled, that they have not enrolled their projects with the Stewardship Center. So we, we may not, we don't know about them and uh, they're not fully Green Shores projects, but they're embodying a lot of the aspects of, of Green Shores. But it is, has uh, meant, been meant to be from the very get-go to be voluntary and not um, linked to any uh, legislative changes. How many projects are you hoping to have in each province to showcase Green Shores? Um, I say the more the merrier. Um, we don't have uh, a target per se. Um, we're working uh, as hard as we can and focusing our, our efforts on our local government working group communities because we have the education happening there, the education training and support uh, from local governments uh, who want to implement these sorts of approaches. So there's a win-win when we can focus our energy there. And on each of the local governments, um, each community, we're hoping to have at least one demonstration project from a municipal perspective. So for example, if they have a park on a shoreline, if they can get that park project, uh, if they're once they're, when they need to do a project, they would get that um, park project uh, designed to the Green Shore standard and get certification. They can put a kiosk up, et cetera and then demonstrate to their, their residents, this is what we'd like to see. So they demonstrate leadership in that. Uh, but basically we, we recognize we wanna get as many uh, projects that are certified so that when uh, folks especially go to the website, they can see, oh, this is what a Green Shores project looks like, this is how they did it. And so we're working on a series of case studies um, that will be up on the website and uh, folks will be able to see that. So um, getting back to the more the merrier, I think uh, the more we can get this, this design guidance used, the, the better off we're all gonna be. And then finally, uh, can the existing program be used for rivers and streams? And uh, basically no, uh, Green Shores is not uh, meant for rivers and streams. As um, many of you know, the uh, the hydraulics of uh, rivers and streams in terms of water flow is very different than uh, those for um, coastal and lake shore systems. So basically what we need to do is develop uh, an additional credit and rating system that would be appropriate for rivers and streams. It certainly has been something that has um, been really uh, 
mentioned quite a few times uh, to have a credit and rating system for rivers and streams. And as a nonprofit, we basically work uh, on, on developing projects as capacity allows. And it's certainly on our to-do list. And uh, we would hope and would love to have uh, Green Shores for Rivers and Streams uh, coming on online uh, in, the, in the next few years as, as we're able. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And um, we will uh, look forward to uh, hearing from you and hopefully seeing some of you in uh, the next uh, few months. There's my email address uh, right up there. And thanks again to um, MTRI for hosting this webinar and um, Canadian Wildlife Service and, uh, uh, and Nova Scotia uh, uh, lands and forestry for um, supporting the work and also thanks to all the various partners and organizations on both coasts for their uh, in-kind support of Green Choice. So with that, I'll bid you uh, adieu.